Blog Talk Radio. we've been having with people and the great poetry that we've been reading. No, definitely. I mean, and the thing is, it also seemed like in the first, you know, week or two of, uh, you know, this thing that we've been going through, it seemed like there was, you know, not a lot of virtual poetry stuff going on. I mean, obviously people were posting stuff on social media and maybe like going live individually, but in terms of, you know, virtual readings or workshops, it didn't, you know, the first couple of weeks, it seemed like there was only a couple of things. And, like, you know, at this point, it's like I'm getting, like, 40 or 50 invites to things a day at this point, like, more than I could actually do now because it's like by this point, everybody's figured out how to do it in one way, shape, or form. So it's kind of like it exponentially exploded. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of a double-edged sword, too, because I know you and I especially, we have connections to different groups in different parts of the country. So it's great because it's the opportunity to participate in those groups' readings and workshops and things. But at the same time, it's kind of like you only have so much time of the day that you can connect to readings. But I think it is excellent that there are so many opportunities for people that, you know, despite all that's going on, we still have ways to get together and to share our poetry and to write and improve and learn. Yeah, definitely. I know. And it's like when when you're going to live events, it's like, you know, people kind of think like, oh, okay, it's Poetry Month. But, you know, I mean, all, all you know, you, you can only make about, I don't know, three or four events a day, <laughs> you know, during yeah. Poetry Month in a really live area. Uh, you know, with the virtual events, it's like, you know, oh, you've only been to a dozen so far today, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're um, limited to how many hours there are in a day, you know. <laughs> I know, darn it, you know, right? But, uh, but yeah, no, it's it's been so many great things, and, you know, one of the things that, you know, the thing that we're featuring tonight here on the show uh, was one of those wonderful things that just kind of shows how, you know, even through distance we can really be connected, and that was, um, you know, the Mondo Anthology that we actually just finished and published, uh, you know, the results of actually a virtual workshop that we did through uh, BardCon Virtual, and, uh you know, the book, you know, went to the printer, uh, you know, on the 23rd, so one week ago today, or rather it went, uh, it actually went live one week ago today, and it actually made best-selling status on Amazon, uh, you know, in a bunch of different categories. It was number four in uh, Japanese poetry and haiku, it was number 16 in poetry anthologies, and it was number one new release in Japanese uh, and haiku poetry for uh, several days there, actually. It was a number one new release, so... Uh, you know, I was really happy about that, and it's been getting really good reviews. Um, you know, and that was a result of a workshop that paired uh, 40 poets together, because uh, for those listening, if they don't know, Amondo is a Japanese collaborative poetry, which, uh, you know, Nick, Nick and I know a little something about that, considering the uh, the Japanese poetry form book that we did. <laughs> yeah, I think that was probably the most exciting thing about that. Like, you know, it's great that we have a book that, 
was hitting bestseller on all these categories, but seeing all these poets come together and pair up and it, it's kind of cool because in a lot of ways, like I've, I've met a lot of these people before doing this workshop. And so I kind of have a feel for their styles and I've always kind of wanted to try and get some of the different groups that we know together and it's like, okay, how can we, who, who would make some really excellent uh, poetry if we paired them together? Whose styles look, would be really interesting together? And I've seen that happen in a, in a microcosm with my workshop as people join and they have these really out there styles and they start to collaborate with each other and uh, you can see the influence. I've always kind of wanted to see it on a bigger scale, see, you know, some of the Long Island poets and how they would influence and be influenced by the Virginia poets, for example. And so it was finally... I finally got to see that in action. Yeah, no, that was definitely, you know, a great thing about it was, you know, seeing all these poets that we knew from different communities and different states and, you know, uh, pairing them up to actually do these because, uh, you know, the Mondo is, it's basically uh, two haiku, for, for lack of a better way of putting it, just to put it simply for people out there listening who don't know, it's, uh, you know, and it's done through, you know, the question and answer, uh, you know, the Zen mindset. So one poet starts the poem with, you know, the first verse that is, you know, typically in the haiku structure, it's 19 syllables or less, so slightly different, but generally, you know, in that range, like five, seven, five syllables. They ask a, a question in poetic verse, and then the second poet responds to that question in poetic verse. So for this workshop, we, you know, pair two poets together. Each one did a question, and then each one did an answer. And, you know, just the the the, the synergy that happened, you know, you know, from doing this and, you know, the wonderful stuff that came out of it was just absolutely amazing. And, you know, all the poets who participated pretty much said the same thing. They were like, you know, they're like, oh, I never did collaborative poetry before, but I can't believe how wonderful it came out. You know, and I think that during this, you know, this uh, crisis we've been going through, you know, collaborative poetry has kind of become like the new popular thing because it's something, you know, it helps the creative juices flowing and it's been bringing people together in a lot of good ways. So, uh, you know, I've been really happy about that. And the Poetic Bridges Project, uh, which is actually going to be pairing poets from the United States with countries all over the world, uh, kind of, you know, the idea for that actually came about after seeing how well this Mondo uh, workshop actually went. So we could thank this book for what is going to be uh, an even bigger book with poets from all over the place. And with that one, we had poets who uh, wrote in from the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, Mexico, Sweden, Greece, and a uh, bunch of other countries too. So that that's going to be phenomenal when, when that's finally done. A little bit bigger than this one. This one was 40 poets. So, you know, uh, you know, 20 pairs of two poets. That one is uh, more like a hundred pairs, so that's going to be a little bit till that one's done. But yeah, so so this little workshop that we kind of did on a whim launched a you know a whole slew of different projects, so it was really great. And uh, I'm excited tonight that we actually have some recordings from some of the Mondo. Now, uh, in most of these cases, because uh, I put out a call to all the poets uh, if they wanted to be featured on the show to, you know, send in their uh, recordings of their Mondo, we've got a lot of, uh, you know, half of a Mondo just by the nature of the fact that it's two poets. And so I got like one, you know, in a lot of cases, one half of the Mondo sent in and the other one didn't. So in some of these cases, uh, you know, when I announce the names of the two people, you're going to hear, you know, my dinky voice uh, kind of go in there to uh, make up for the other half of it. So disclaimer, uh, you're going to hear me a lot uh, on some of these. Uh, but but even even so, like even, uh, you know, I'm just happy to hear the words, you know, just from some of the poets, how they were intended, because as, as you always like to point out, Nick, that's uh, usually the best way to hear it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And one really nice thing about the Mondo activity and or as an exercise for workshops specifically with the question portion, is it's a really great way of breaking writer's block because for, for some reason, at least whenever I do write a mondo with somebody and I'm finishing their verse, whenever I get posed a question, the answer and the rest of the poem forms almost instantly in my head. It becomes very easy to write the next line and it's, it's a good way of sort of unlocking that creativity and getting to, you know, write other things beyond that after forming the answer because once you've answered the question, it opens up all these other ideas. And I don't know if that's just a personal thing or if that's something that more people experience when they're doing this, but I find this a great activity to break writer's block. 
Yeah, well, I mean, actually, you know, in the, the Zen practice of doing the Mondo, it, it was supposed to be very much, you know, reactionary and from the gut. Uh, and I do think a lot of people find it harder to pose the question than to answer the question, because it did seem like a lot of the responses came pretty instantly, and people were like, wow, that just kind of came out of nowhere. So, you know, and I felt I felt a similar thing, too, with, you know, because since this started, I was trying to, like, write my own poetry, and it wasn't really coming very well until I started doing the collaborations, and then it just kind of, you know, went gangbusters, so, but, uh, all right, so this first Mondo that we have here is actually, uh, it, you know, the two Mondo pairings, it's uh, by Christina Norcross uh, and Jeannie Roberts, so Christina Norcross sent in her recording, and I, I filled in probably less elegantly uh, than Jeannie would have herself, but uh, that, that's what we have, so. Poem 1, verse 1, by Christina M. R. Norcross. How long must the earth seek a sacred time of love while its people spin blindly? To love is to heal. Like love, the earth is patient. She awaits divine timing. By Jeannie E. Roberts. Poem 2. First verse by Jeannie E. Roberts. When water ripples... Does its eternal whisper reveal an ancient language? Waves of wisdom flow. Water speaks in humming trills. Unfurling flowers listen. You know, I, I can never get over, like, even though, like, like, how short these poems are, but how much are packed into, you know, the short verse. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And it's, the, again, something relaxing about the shortness of it, the brevity of it. And it's it's almost impossible not to have nice imagery in something so short. Um, I, I don't know, it sounds strange to say because it's, it's actually very difficult. And that's one of the tricks to really good Japanese forms is it, capturing a lot with as few words as possible and really sort of capturing a snapshot of a moment. But it, I feel like it's very difficult almost to write in these forms and not do that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I say that's pretty prevalent just from how, you know, very concise and zen-like, you know, all these verses came out, you know, with how a good, you know, like with the results of the workshop, I think they kind of speak for themselves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the next... uh Next pairing that we have is uh, Catherine Goddard and Bethany James, and both sections of this are being read by Catherine Goddard. Mondo by Catherine Goddard and Bethany Camille James. How can birds still sing in the hush that has become our world? Pandemic. The bird song just is. The world keeps spinning around the courage to live. Do bees love honey? Do they pollinate with it? Pollinate all the flowers? The way they do it, giving back to all the world? This sweet, vibrant life. Yeah, another thing about Mondo is that, you know, a lot of these poems typically they, uh, you know, they take the nature approach. And that, that came through in a lot of them. Yeah. And, and one theme that I've been noticing with the a lot of the mondo that came out of this activity or this workshop is that the questions tend to be generally negative or generally uh, neutral, and I'm wondering if maybe that's just a sign of our times, but almost all the answers to them are extremely positive. Yeah, that, that was something that I was noticing a lot in also, or, you know, maybe, maybe like the question wasn't necessarily negative, but... You know, there was definitely, I mean, some of them were, some of them were just kind of ponderous and deep or, you know, maybe had, you know, a tint of the bittersweet. But, yeah, most of the most of the answers were, were definitely positive, uh, which, you know, the next example we have is uh, kind of a, a good one to go into for, for that because uh, it's by Mike Krogan and uh, Laura Godler. Half of it read by Mike Krogan and... Me substituting for Laura, so put that in. 
My name is Mike Krogan, and this is the first half of a Mondo collaboration with Laura Lafitier Gobbler. What will be revealed as each of us delves into the deep well of solitude? A healing of wounded memory, gulping the oxygen of time. Mondo 2. I'm afraid, Mommy. It's so dark. Where are you? I'm scared too, my love. But simply open your eyes. I'm here, and so is the sun. Wow, that you were one, kidding about positive. Yeah, that, that second one in particular was exactly what you were talking about. <laughs> yes, definitely. And I really like that answer. I feel like that's basically the only answer to that question. I mean, okay, that's not true, but it was the, the only, it's the best answer to that question. Yeah, that, that poem, you know, for that poem in that moment, I feel like, you know, once you hear that answer, you really do have that attitude, like, yeah, that is the answer, you know, so I can, even though there are infinitely many other answers, that is, <laughs> it, just, it just feels that way. I, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yeah. So, with the last Mondo pairing that we have on recording, and then we're going to read a couple of more, and maybe we'll be shameless and read ours again, um, actually have both parts of the Mondo for this one. So, and a little creative editing that I had, actually, I got the last bits of this, like about 20 minutes before we went live. So, uh, <laughs> you know, nothing, nothing like the cutting wow. on the floor. Uh, but this pairing is by Robert Fleming and, uh, Benjamin Chris from who's from the UK and Robert Fleming down by, by, well, was in Virginia. Now he's in Delaware. Apparently he originally came from Canada Robert Fleming is just all over the place. <laughs> Robert Fleming, Mondo poem, question. A man, Sam I am, from sperm and egg, I am Stan. Sam and Stan, what makes a man? A man is not made. He forges himself through flame like a social Frankenstein. Why do some souls scream while others meekly whisper a muted soliloquy? To lure a lost lover, a lover's call is called on all wavelength waves. I really just love how it sounds when, when you actually get, like, the two different voices, but the same poem. Yeah. And hearing the end of one poem and the beginning of another, and so it flows, it almost sounds like one poem. Yeah. Even even when the case of the, the subject being very different in the first one from the second one. Yeah, I know. We we may have to figure out a new a new way to do live readings to kind of showcase this somehow. I mean, even though some of these people are in totally different places, you know, or maybe maybe we'll have to figure out an audio book or something. I don't know because it's like there's there's just something too good about you know the pairings and how they work out. Yeah. Well, I mean, the dream would be to just even though they're in different places right now, have an event that's big enough that we can bring everybody together, but of course, you know, that's probably not feasible uh, with travel and time and money and all of that. Yeah. Well, hey, you never know. Maybe we'll have another, another, uh, you know, big multi-hundred person convention one of these days. That yeah, would be like fun. The, like the women bicentennial. Yes. So that was all the recordings that I got from uh, the Mondo book, but I'm going to read a couple of more. Uh, this pairing I want to read is by Sharon Anderson and Anne-Marie Merzen. Uh, the first one's going to be Sharon Anderson, and then the second verse is Anne-Marie. Where will my footsteps direct me as I wander, seeking out a goal? Sometimes skipping can add weightlessness to a line, that we must not draw. 
you know, again, I, I really love the, the immediate answers that come for that. And so this is the inverse of that. The question was posed by Anne-Marie Merzen, and the, the answer is by Sharon Anderson. And if people know Sharon Anderson, got, the, the, the answer is going to seem a little bit familiar just with Sharon's style. Why did the white owl roost in the lavender bush at the curve in the sidewalk? And Sharon's response is, I find my answer lies not in the question why, but in the who. <laughs> <laughs> That's uplifting in its own way. <laughs> I know. You know, and it's definitely just, you know, when the future textbooks go over the poetry of Sharon Anderson, they're going to be like, yep, that is, that is textbook Sharon. Because <laughs> she, she, she's but great with like- the poetry and maybe it's because of the form and because of the way everybody else is writing it It, it's almost like stepping into a pothole you didn't see until you stepped in it but in a good way (laughs) in that you know it's when somebody makes a joke or a pun on something and you you just the mood and the tone is nowhere near it so you just expect it less because of that and you're just completely unprepared for it you get blindsided and you laugh harder because of it yeah definitely so this next pairing is uh, Sharon Dockweiler and Larry Jeff. Sharon Dockweiler here on Long Island, Larry Jeff uh, down in uh, Florida, Pinellas County. So the question was from Sharon. Do the starfish cry because they do not shimmer like the stars above? And Larry's response, I seem to recall when stars were incandescent and you swore you could eat them. Oh man, there's so much to unpack with that response. I know. Like, like you don't. Book is the question. Also has layers. I know these are great. Like I I really hope that this collaborative poetry, you know, well, I can't really say starts a trend because the trend has kind of existed for you know over a thousand years in you know Japan and some other cultures, but in in America, it's. uh, I wouldn't say it's an, it's never been known before because obviously you have run on poems and things like that, but I'd say it's it's rel- it's relatively untouched territory in the large scale of things. So I really hope we see a lot more of this. So yeah, the I definitely half, agree. Yeah, the second half of their collaboration quickly. Larry Jeff and Sharon Dockweiler. Larry asking the question now: A virus seeks to survive without longevity. We ask why, why, why? And Sharon's response. Paused, we survive. With levity, we try, try, try. I like to echo the repetition of why and then the try. I know. You get you get that actually at several points within the book, people who are kind of mimicking the, the first poet's repetition or... Uh, alliteration, things like that, you know, to, again, the synergy with this was just absolutely great. So, you know, and yeah. I also, I'm just happy with how, how the book itself came out because, you know, it's, uh, it's part instructional book and anthology because we got the 40 poems in there, obviously, uh, you know, the results of the workshop, but at the front of, you know, the book, we talk, we have pages that explain what the Mondo is and how to write it. And then the back of the book, we actually lay out some, uh, Mondo writing exercises for, you know, workshop leaders and teachers and professors out there who may want to kind of mimic what we did. So, yeah. You know. And if you're skeptical that you don't think, you know, in these workshops, it's it's interesting and this works for every collaborative workshop we've run to not just the Mondo ones, but it's amazing how everything comes together. Everything fits. It, I've never been to a collaborative workshop where there was a verse that seemed out of place and it didn't have, didn't fit within what everybody else wrote. And so if you're skeptical about that. Try one. It's amazing. It's like this mind meld. Yeah. I, I would say that, you know, situations where something, you know, is, is a little clunky is definitely like the exception, not the rule. The rule is that things tend to just, you know, cosmically or through the power of the universe or whatever it tends to it tends to work out really well. You know, and when it comes to you know, like I, I say that the more people you have involved, the more potential there is for things going a little astray, especially with other forms like the Renga. But 
you know, there's there's ways to curtail that. And with the Mondo, it's like especially if it's, you're pairing up two people or if you're doing a roundabout where you have, like, say, four or five people and everybody's kind of switching, it, it's almost impossible for it to go too crazy because everybody really just takes off of each other and, you know, they kind of mirror each other's energy. It's, it's something psychological and spiritual all happening at once. It's absolutely great. So, I, And I would definitely encourage any workshop – leader out there yeah give give it a try you know because you, you, you never know until you try and it's definitely worth the try so uh for the next mondo pairing or rather the last one for today because we have a few more uh we have a couple of open mic readers that we're gonna we're gonna play but uh this uh this odd you know this odd uh, couple of poets in here uh james p wagner and nick hale oh i think i've heard of those guys before yeah, I don't know. I think there, there's a couple of scrubs, but, you know, it's got to be fair, right? So, yeah. this, first one, this first one, the question was posed by James P. Wagner. And that question is, how much potential, energy, never kinetic, has been wasted? And the answer was posed by, do you have the answer in front of you? Yes, I do. Oh, I do. Here we go. Oh, I found it. So, uh, potential held cannot be wasted. Each moment, endless possibility. Yeah, and again, that kind of goes with with what you were saying about how the question could have a possible negative tint and then you spin around with a positive. Yeah. That was... uh, Kind of intentional on my part. <laughs> so, what about the uh, what about the question posed by that Nick Hale guy? Oh, this guy! I can't believe this question. How long must I wait before the waiting becomes wasting? And then James P. Wagner's response: How quick can action, deliberate and focused, change everything? So another sharp turn there in the uh yeah the direction of the tone. Yeah. I was really happy with how that came out. I mean, I know that we had the advantage of uh you know, knowing each other for, you know, just a couple of years. Um Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but like I said in the forward for this book, I said with few exceptions, us, us being one of them, uh, you know, and Christina Norcross and Jeannie Roberts knew each other. But it was, in most cases, the poets in this book, you know, most of the 40 had actually never encountered each other's work before because they were from different states so and different communities. So, you know, if you if you know each other, it can help, but it's definitely not a necessity because – you know, some people in this actually, they, uh, you know, since doing this, they actually became Facebook friends, and now they're liking each other's posts and commenting, and they've actually become friends just from this workshop, so that was another great thing I loved about it. Yeah, so, uh, so sometimes knowing each other can be a challenge, it can make it more challenging, because you may have an idea it formed in your head. I don't know about anyone else, but when I was writing my response, this is actually one of my, the most difficult because I knew what I wanted to answer, but I didn't know how to condense it into fewer words. I had like a whole two paragraph of response and I had to tear that down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I could see the pros and cons to each. So, you know, it comes, you know, always unique challenges, but, uh, yeah. So that was the, uh, the featured portion for the Mondo. Uh, I would encourage uh, anybody out there who's interested, check out, uh, you know, the book on Amazon.com. The official title of it is The Mondo, a poetry anthology and workshop guide. Uh, You know, it's doing pretty well on Amazon, and uh, if you are a workshop leader, it definitely might be something to, uh, you know, to seriously consider doing for uh, an upcoming workshop. So uh, we've got a few other... uh, Recordings from some quote unquote open mic poets. Uh, this one is by Lucy Coons, who is a poet down by you, and she's been on here a couple of times, so let's give it up for Lucy. Biscuits, a villanelle style poem by Lucy Coons. As sunshine angles through the windows above the soapstone sink, 
age-spotted hands move to and fro, to and fro. Flower dusts the board below. A wrinkled lid gives a wink as sunshine angles through the window. A pat, a slap to biscuit dough, a warming oven heats to pink. Age-spotted hands move to and fro, to and fro. The mound rolled flat to stretch and grow, a wooden pin the perfect link, as sunshine angles through the window. A biscuit cutter presses low, perfect circles, not a rink. Age-spotted hands move to and fro, to and fro. Eighteen biscuits, six to a row, in the oven, cross the brink, as sunshine angles through the window. Age-spotted hands move to and fro, to and fro. Really like the repetition on that one. Yeah, same. And I wouldn't have known it was a villanelle, or I wouldn't have recognized it as one if uh, she didn't mention it beforehand, which is kind of the mark of a good form, especially with forms with repetition, is when you get lost in the poem and you can't tell that that's what they're doing, that, that it is a form. And especially with villanelles, that's impressive, because villanelles are difficult to write as it is. Definitely. I mean, I you know, sometimes I, I do find myself on, at a reading actually listening for, you know, str- well, I, not sometimes, pretty much all the time I, when I hear, you know, repetition and things like that. I do actually try to listen to see if I can identify the form pattern. But, yeah, no, the reading of that one, definitely you kind of would have gotten lost in it. So, uh, you know, that that's definitely a good thing. Yeah. Next up, we have a poetic and musical interlude uh, by Mary Phillips, who's been on Cards Poetry Revolution several times now, and there's another one of those where you get to hear the music in the background. So. We lay upon the grass under the stars. Above us the evening sky was dark and clear. Behold, a shooting star. Its bright golden tail scribbled our names across the sky. It was then that we were lifted up into the rhapsody of a cobalt space where stars uncoiled like illuminated threads encircling us in the celestial love that God had set in motion before the foundation of the universe. Love, come down. The stars watched on, some flickering, some exploding, sprinkling resplendent flakes of light as sweet music played, familiar in some way, yet ancient in another. And within the midst of the moonlight we spun under nature's with no walls, just the roof of a watchful sky, breaking through the veil of darkness, and I sensed that we were loved, loved in an infinite way. Love, come down. Feel him in the of a storm. Feel him in emotion. Feel him in each breath. Step back into the world where time is not our own and expectations are like slick green moss under our feet that sometimes causes us to slip 
reminding us that we are never in complete control. Within the worst of times, when all seems bleak and all words fail and greatness is cut down like a grand old oak, God is still in the midst. When we find ourselves alone on a deserted beach with only the raging sea before us, He is there. He is with me. My family and my friends are with me. Like the sun that spreads its rays across the surface of the earth, awakening all life and penetrating all that lies beneath with the promise of eternity and the promise of love. There, there in the light of who I am and in the ashes of who I was, I can still see us all together, floating, floating like weightless flurries in the air that sometimes from certain angles, glisten like diamonds in the sun as love comes down. seeing, you know, like just the creative stuff that people can do when they put poetry to music. Yeah, definitely. I'm wondering there there's something about that song that was familiar in a way. So I really enjoyed particularly the bass line in it. Um but how it sort of added to the poem itself too. Yeah, well, I know that Mary has a history in music as well as poetry, so that, you know, that definitely explains how it always comes together so well for her. Yeah, I mean, it's a good combination, too. I mean, it's basically the literary chocolate and peanut butter. Yeah, exactly. It's poetry Reese's, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so next up, we have uh, a poem by Sandra Fien, who's been on Bard's Poetry Revolution before. She's a poet from Ohio, so give it up for her. Blue Roses. The first time we put on makeup was at Grandma's house under a clandestine Connecticut pine. We sat cross-legged on the mudstone we had once used as a picnic table, carefully coloring our lips with pink candy lipstick. You know what I think about when I'm feeling bad? You said matter-of-factly, now chewing the sugar crayon with the exuberance for gum. I think about blue roses, big, deep, Blue roses, roses with feather petals to sleep on, like one giant bed of pillows. So next time you're sad, dream about blue roses. Then you'll feel all better. Twenty years ramble through pine, like sun caressing your freckled nose. Toothless coral grin, sapience of five years. Memories imprint beholds, an Indian summer day, its bouquet of blue roses. It's smile. More na- more nature and, uh, you know, just the beauty of nature coming through. Yeah. And that and relaxing poetry seems to be a big theme that we've been getting a lot of. And, I mean, I, for one, really like that. So, I think it's great. I feel like I sound like a broken record because I keep saying I really enjoyed that and I liked hearing that, but, you know, it's true, so I'm going to keep saying it. (laughs) Yeah, no, and I'm, you know, that that was a, there was something very relaxing and soothing about that, you know, the the style that she read it too, so uh, I definitely have to agree with you. So, next poet is Melissa Felsen, and uh, she actually has a poem forthcoming in uh, Nassau County Voices and Verse. Uh, which is a new Long Island publication, one of the county ones. From city block to lush green yard, I am from sidewalk and lawn, somewhere amidst bright eager eyes and a teen's disinterested yawn. 
I am from Kraft Mac and Cheese, from good friends and juice boxes, bred from thrilled September joy of book bags and lunch boxes. Yet I am from another time, pubescence and young tyrants, who stormed the castle walls with taunts and chased me toward the hills. I am from those sloping hills, clay shaping and molding, love and pain, the urgency of grades, and the urgency of friends all smoldering. And I am from this morning's sun, which tells a newer story, a future built of joy and hurt, filled with love, purpose, and glory. I am from the heartache of a lover's torn forever, from the pain and tears and torments of piecing him together. Yet I am from the knowledge that I have fought these battles, and the knowledge that I've had these joys and will have them hereafter. I have to say, that is probably my favorite poem of that form that I've ever heard. Um, if you don't recognize the I am from form, it's basically the use of the repetition I am from when describing yourself. Uh, but that is probably my favorite one of those forms I've ever heard. Yeah, I mean, you know, hard to not be instantly intrigued when they say Kraft macaroni and cheese, you know? <laughs> yes. Well, and the rhyming was so well done that it, I didn't even realize there was rhyming until halfway through. And again, it's like like with forms, having a rhyme scheme that doesn't beat you over the head is is it yeah you know, when you have to kind of try to recognize it, it's a good sign or it's a, a sign of a good rhyme scheme or a good rhyme. Yeah, because it means that it's just kind of, you know, the natural flow of things, you know, without it being like a jarring, you know, comes to a halt at the end of every rhyme. When it's like flowing within the verse, it, you know, much more natural and sounds like it belongs there. Yeah. So we got one more short poem uh, before we close out for the evening. And this one actually was from the uh, the upcoming New Jersey Bards uh, Northwest Poetry Review, which would have launched during Poetry Month while we were on our typical tour, but, uh, you know, things happen, and uh, we will reschedule that. So let's hear it up for Joan Malloy. Joan Malloy, Lunatic Takers. A waif has no place in polite society. Dirty, unclean. But through all their struggles, they have been chosen chosen to be called obscene by the shakers the makers the lunatic takers the ones with souls as shifty as a thieves Speaking of good, you know, flowing rhyme, I really like the, the uh, you know, internal rhyme in that one. Yeah, me too. And, I mean, the, the, I was intrigued immediately by the title when I was going through and editing the anthology. And it's like, oh, man, I have to read this one first. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, of course, I enjoyed the poem also. <laughs> it wasn't just the title that intrigued me, but I was – you know, intrigued from start to finish, I guess I'll say. Yeah, now I can see why. So, episode's about to wrap up, so I want to thank uh, everybody who sent in recordings. I want to thank everybody who took part in the Mondo workshop and, uh, you know, who's been uh, just really happy with how that came out. Uh, thank you, everybody who was listening, and thank you, everybody who made Poetry Month uh, a really good month despite the challenges. Uh, thank you, Nick, for being my co host. Well, thanks for having me on. And I want to echo that. Thanks to everybody who sent in poems, who participated in the workshop, who list, who's been sticking with us and listening to our shows and joining us on social media, participating in these collaborative forums and writing poetry and making the most of this poetry month. It's been an excellent poetry month. I mean, I've had a great time. So I hope everyone else has too. So uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, check out the Mondo uh, Poetry Book on Amazon.com and check out uh, BardCon Virtual because we still have things going there. Uh, I'm James P. Wagner. And I'm Nick Hale. And we'll see you next time.
Good night.